Welcome to Comment with me, George Galloway, here on Press TV. Still the voice of the voiceless. Comment is the big conversation, sometimes even the great debate. But it can only be either of those if you join in. That's why, above all, I need your telephone calls. 44208-601-4555. That's the number to call. You call us, we'll call you back, establish a clear line. And remember, if you get on the TV with me, the volume on your TV has to be down at zero. You can SMS the show on 4478-0008066. Or you can email me at comment at pressTV.co.uk. This being the 21st century, you can even tweet me at comment underscore press TV. Tonight, we're discussing two questions. And the first of those is this. Why is Israel so nervous about the Iran nuclear agreement with the permanent five plus one? That was reached in Lausanne last week and announced. But ever since, the war drums have been pounding on the right in the United States, apparently coordinated from Tel Aviv. Benjamin Netanyahu is bought and paid for by the United States taxpayer, and yet he's actually challenging the right of the American president to rule. That's the long and the short of it. This man thinks he is the president of the United States of America, and that these people have no right to reach an agreement about the nuclear question with Iran without his say-so, a say-so which, of course, would never be forthcoming. The United States policy appears to have undergone a U-turn, or has it? We'll be discussing that, particularly in the context of our second question this evening, that of Yemen. But the Iranians... Uh, say that any attack upon them by Israel would be met with devastating consequences. And I think you can take it that they are not bluffing. This speech at the United States Congress by Netanyahu was an open, brazen, overt subversion of the United States democratic process. And the U.S. Republican Party is deeply in league with a foreign ruler, Benjamin Netanyahu, who is seeking to bend the foreign policy of the most powerful country in the world to his taste. He, the ruler of a country of just seven million people on the shores of the Mediterranean, many thousands of miles away from the United States. So why is Israel nervous about the Iran nuclear agreement? Well, first of all, they're pretending to be nervous to some extent so that they can further undermine President Obama, further assist the U.S. Republican far right into power at the next presidential election, and in any case demonstrate to the congressional majority that Israel demands that whatever happens, this agreement should never be implemented, at least by the United States. Personally, I'm not much concerned about that. The agreement was with the permanent five plus one. And if the other members of the permanent five plus one have anything about them at all, they'll tell the American Republican Party where to go on the subject of the destabilization of the agreement. And maybe once the other members of the P5 plus one start doing important business with Iran, on oil, on gas, on infrastructure, even, of course, on the nuclear question, maybe American capitalism will bring its pressure to bear on the Republican Party to fall into line with the rest of the world. Iran's position, I believe, is absolutely dignified. They have not given up their inalienable right to develop nuclear power peacefully. They are continuing with all their business, all their relations with the rest of the world. And if the agreement is wrecked by Israel, then let it be wrecked. The rest of the world will have to face the consequences of that. I believe that Iran has an opportunity now 
to build new relations with the rest of the world. If the United States doesn't want to be a part of that, well, so be it. Iran can live without the United States of America. Indeed, ever since the overthrow of the tyrant Shah, the greatest dictator of them all, Iran's been doing rather well without the support, without the cooperation, without the goodwill of the United States of America. So that's the first question. Why is Israel nervous about the Iran nuclear agreement? The second question is not entirely unrelated, and it's this. Will Saudi Arabia's war on Yemen spill over into other countries? If you watched last week, you'll know that a Saudi-Israeli-American war has been launched on Saudi Arabia's neighboring country of Yemen. This evening, they bombed the defense ministry, an important point to which I shall return. They have sought to establish a narrative that the problem in Yemen, and it is a problem, is somehow the fault of Iran. But as Syed Hassan Nasrallah said, and I saw it with my own eyes, the Saudis actually had relations with the Houthi rebels who are a part of the coalition of fighters who are at war with Saudi Arabia's ally right now in Yemen. Saudi Arabia had, until the day before the death of the late King Abdullah, relations with the Houthis. And we have Syed Hassan Nasrallah's word on that, and he never lies. Saudi Arabia knows that the complex problems of the Yemen have nothing to do with Iran. They know because they gave sanctuary to the former president, Ali Abdullah Saleh, who was hospitalized in their country with 45% burns. They spent millions of dollars patching him up, sending him back to Yemen, and now he's making war on the current, or rather immediately ex-president, Hadi, who himself has now fled to Saudi Arabia. This is a civil war in Yemen. It's a civil war between two presidents, both of them ex-presidents, both of them former allies or current allies of Saudi Arabia. The Houthis are for sure a ferocious and very militarily successful guerrilla revolutionary organization, but the war is largely being carried by the army of Yemen, which remains loyal to the former, former President Ali Abdullah Saleh. Neither has this anything to do with sectarianism. The Muslim Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood in Yemen, are Zaydis, which is a kind of Shiite. The Houthis are Zaydis. Ali Abdullah Saleh is a Zaydi. They're all Zaydis. This has nothing to do with Sunni versus Shia and has everything to do with a terror in the heart of the Saudi dictatorship that their days are numbered and numbered in very short numbers, if you ask me. Let's take the first call of the evening. Muhammad Ali is in Leeds. Muhammad, welcome to the show. Why is Israel nervous about the agreement in your view? Uh, thank, thank you for taking my call, George. Welcome. Yeah, uh, well, obviously, uh, Israel will be nervous because obviously it doesn't have uh, the best ties with Iran. But do you think that Iran uh, developing a nuclear program is the is the best idea for the for the area? Well, I do. They're not developing nuclear weapons. They've made that clear. And the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, has confirmed that many many times. And this new agreement that has been reached in Switzerland allows for intrusive inspection on an unprecedented scale by the IAEA. Israel, on the other hand, does have nuclear weapons, as you well know. It has hundreds of them. 
So I've never been entirely sure why Israel is allowed to have hundreds of nuclear weapons and Iran is not allowed to have one. But Iran doesn't want to have one. It hasn't built one. It doesn't intend to build one. What it is doing is harnessing the nuclear technology, which every country has the right to, to build a nuclear energy uh, industry. It's oil, it's gas, it's finite, like everyone else's is finite. It has energy needs. It would like to export more of its oil and gas and rely more and more on peaceful nuclear energy. Nothing wrong with that, Mohammed, is there? Well, I agree, but do you think your stance come, come from you because you are a, you don't really, uh, well, you're not the biggest supporter of Israel. Uh, can you imagine if you were Israeli that uh, you would be getting nervous if Iran had nuclear weapons? It's a bit of a strange argument coming from someone called Muhammad Ali in Leeds, if you don't mind me saying so. Muhammad's like watching a bear dancing. It's just unnatural somehow. Israel has hundreds of nuclear weapons. Hundreds. 200. 220, to be as precise as anyone can be. What would Israel have a right to be nervous about in Iran developing an IAEA-regulated, non-proliferation treaty-signed, peaceful nuclear energy industry. Mohammed? Yeah, um, well, to be honest, George, I think your uh, arguments on, uh, on Israel is a bit hypocritical because you disagree with Netanyahu and you, you call him a war criminal, but you, you stood with Saddam Hussein, and he is probably the biggest war criminal uh, in recent times. So how can you condone apartheid in Israel? Are you, when you are, 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 are you a supporter of Netanyahu, Mohammed? Well, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I want to say I'm a why, supporter why of Netanyahu. Why are you on here I, shilling? Why are you on uh, here shilling for the Israelis on this no, show, no, no, Mohammed? No, I'm not shilling for anyone. I, I'm, I no, you are. You no, you are. Everyone listening. You everyone listening to you. Because you, stood, you stood Mohammed, Mohammed, everyone, I'll let you back in. Everyone listening to you knows that you're on here shilling for Israel. This argument has nothing to do with me. It's not about me. It's about whether a Muslim country is allowed to develop nuclear energy and whether Israel, the Zionist, apartheid, imperial state, the settler state founded by European colonial Zionists has a right to stop any Muslim country from developing nuclear energy. And I cannot understand why somebody called Muhammad Ali in Leeds would come on the show and argue what you're arguing. Over to you. I am not for or anti-Israel. Oh, you're, you're not anti-Israel. You're not anti-Israel. Muhammad, Muhammad, I want to get that clear. I'll let you back in. You're not okay, anti-Israel. You. I am not. I'm definitely not anti-Israel. Okay. okay. Well, that's, that's but, a revelation. That's a okay, revelation. I, that, no, no. I, fair enough. That's a revelation. Might come as a surprise to some of your neighbors in Leeds, also called names like Muhammad or Ali, but you're not anti-Israel. At least we've established that. Now, go ahead. Can I come back? Thank you, George. Um, yeah, go ahead. I just, I just want to say, what if Saddam Hussein was developing... Saddam Hussein is dead. Okay. Israel, well, you stood with Israel him. is alive. How can you support Saddam Hussein Israel. is dead. We, 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 Israel we, 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 is we, we, alive we and kicking Palestinians every day, killing them, not kicking them, killing them, occupying their land, building illegal settlements on it, threatening their neighbors, building up a nuclear stockpile. And you, Muhammad Ali in Leeds, come on this show to talk about somebody long dead and say that you're not against Israel. Hang your head in shame, Muhammad Ali in Leeds. Let's go on to the next caller, uh, who is Othman in London. Stop the war. About the demonstration, is it Muna Othman uh, on Saturday about Yemen? Go ahead. 
Hi, George. Thanks Hi. for having me. Thank you. Um, firstly, I'd just like to actually reiterate what you said earlier, that this in Yemen, this is a sectarian war, even though Western media would like to portray it otherwise. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and Saudi Arabia has at one point or another supported different political alliances, including Saleh, a former dictator, when it's benefited them. Um, but it's, it's paramount really now more than ever that we do come out for this protest on Saturday, um, organized by Stop the War, and to reinforce really the lack of support for this, that we as the British public have for the last for the Saudi regime, um, especially since the Arab Spring, who's been interfering heavily in the region's politics, and that the Saudi-led coalition, coalition bombardment in most parts is motivated by Western um, and dictatorship monarchy governments like the Saudis um, trying to maintain their agendas. Um, th this is really quite evident uh, with the U.S speeding up delivery of weapons to Saudi Arabia, which has been reported quite widely lately. Um, and with Saudi Arabia being Britain's most uh, prolific arms buyer, and with reports that the Saudi government is using UK-made typhoons and tornadoes, it's paramount that we do actually reiterate that we are against the, the stance of the British government's foreign policy as a whole, um, you know, especially after the foreign secretary. I know a lot of people have heard that Philip Hammond has said that he... He, he will, the UK government is willing to give diplomatic, logistical and technical support to Saudi Arabia. Um, so I'm just reiterating really that it's important that we do come down on Saturday uh, to say that we're against the Saudi-led bombardment, uh, which is really exacerbating the, the situation in Yemen and will do in the region as a whole, but especially the humanitarian crisis at the moment, which is just... Uh, it's getting a lot, lot worse than most people actually do know about. And obviously with the no-fly zone, um, a lot of aid is not coming into the country, medical aid, which is really needed. And Saudi are just taking a stance that this is a, a war of, this is a bombardment of legitimacy, really. Look and at the that, children. I'm just looking at the children, the casualties, scalded and burned and maimed and murdered by these it, criminals in Saudi Arabia with the support of our own government here in Britain, as you say, and of course the actual military cooperation of the United States government and the Israeli government, which is doing uh, some of the intelligence work for this uh, operation. Yet the British people were never consulted about this, Mona. We were never asked whether we wanted to murder these children on behalf of Saudi Arabia, were we? I think that's the, that's the thing that we need to reiterate, that we as the British, uh, as the British public have never really been consulted in any wars, George, uh, you know, let alone this one. But the fact that the government has taken a stance of, you know, we don't have any um, military interventions, we're not really involved because we don't have soldiers, but, you know, we're willing to give logistical and technical support and we're willing to use our UK-made typhoons and tornadoes, um, in retrospect, we are involved, you know? This oh, is, we are, for this sure. For sure we're involved. Muna, exactly. just tell us, uh, tell us again where, when, and what time this protest is. Um, it's going to be on Saturday, this Saturday, um, outside the Saudi embassy, and it's starting from 1 p.m. Obviously, we're going to have a lot of speakers, and we're going to try and highlight the humanitarian crisis because we've had about 500-plus deaths so far with about 80 deaths of children. And as you said, burned, maimed, um, neighborhoods completely destroyed. So it's just to reiterate that it's Saturday. Um, 1 Saturday, 1 o'clock at the Saudi Embassy in Charles Street, London, W1, just off Park Lane. Yep. I wish you all the best with that, Mona. I can't be there because I'm up in Bradford. I hope you'll understand. And I wish you a very successful protest. Thanks very much for coming on the show. Shadia's in London on the same subject. Let's hear from you, Shadia. Hi there, George. Thanks for having me on the show. Welcome. Um, really, I just want to reiterate exactly what the uh, previous speaker said, but um, as a young person myself, what's important is to look at the UK's foreign policy and how does this really affect young people in the United Kingdom today. Whilst the United Kingdom are waging war in other countries spending 
absolutely gross amounts of money, killing and maiming hundreds of thousands of people across the Middle East. We also see uh, the plight of the young people within the United Kingdom today. We see austerity measures have gone sky high, uh, cuts to the educational system, the NHS. Uh, all of these services have been cut, cut, cut again whilst they find uh, the money to wage war in other countries. And we have to look at this in, in, in a sense, in a broader sense, on, on an international level. What the United Kingdom is doing by arming Saudi Arabia is to try and get one once again, it's the same story. It's about money. It's about oil. It's still about an ideological, strategic, geographical, military control of a region. And the same story has unfolded like it did in Iraq, all the way through to Bahrain and now Yemen. And this is why, as the previous speaker said, it's so important to get as many people on the streets to exercise our, um, our democratic right within this country to make a change, to make a political change. What happened um, is that in no truest Saudi Arabian fashion, the coalition against Yemen that was declared overnight without any public debate, without any public discussion. And that's why claiming the streets of the United Kingdom on Saturday is so, so important. Magnificent, Shadia. Great call. Thanks very much indeed for joining us on comments. So there you have it at 1 p.m. on Saturday, the 11th of April, two days from now, outside the Saudi Embassy in Charles Street, London, W1. The Saudi regime uh, rests on the very narrowest of bases. The great majority of people in Saudi Arabia have benefited scarcely at all from the undreamt of riches that God gave Arabia in every sense, the holy places, the Arabic language, the Prophet Muhammad, and all that oil, all that wealth. But the vast majority of ordinary people in Saudi Arabia have not benefited at all or scarcely at all from that uh, bonanza. The regime, on the other hand, is the corrupt of the earth, looting billions, hundreds of billions from its own people and from underneath its own soil. And therefore, they can't get anyone who would be prepared to die for them from their own country. There will be no Saudi army in Yemen. The Yemens would send them back with their tail between their legs in very large numbers and very quickly. But they hope to persuade Pakistan to do the dying for them. Nisar is on the line from Pakistan. Go ahead, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Alaykum salam. Thank you for having me. Welcome. Go ahead. Uh, I am calling from Quetta, Pakistan, a city which is affected by the Saudis since last 10 years. Uh, the government of Nawaz Sharif, who is very near to our family of Saud, have already sent troops to Saudi and lying in the parliament that he has not done so. Saudi King Suleiman demanded three divisions of Pakistan army comprising of Sunni soldiers only, although Pakistan is a country of Sunni and Shia brothers. Despite of all, we all Pakistani citizens, Shia and Sunnis, are against the wheelchaired Saudi king and his family. And we are sure that the brave and righteous Yemenis will defeat this house of Saud. And inshallah, we will see the dead bodies of Saud in the streets very soon. All the Pakistanis. All the Pakistanis are Shia or Sunni. They are in favor of the people who are aggressed, who are oppressed all over the world. Well, look, that's, we a, they... that's a good call. I don't want to see any more dead bodies. And I say this matter has to be resolved by negotiation on the basis of a national unity government and the territorial integrity of Yemen. We're discussing that and the nuclear question after this short news bulletin. In just three minutes, I'll be back, God willing. Don't go away.
You're watching Comment with me, George Galloway, here on Press TV, still the voice of the voiceless. We need your calls, your SMS, your emails, and even your tweets. We're discussing Israel's nervousness about the Iranian agreement with the permanent 5 plus 1 on the nuclear question. And we're discussing will Saudi Arabia's war on Yemen spill over? Faz is in the UK and on the line. Faz, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, George, for uh, uh, taking my call. Hope welcome. you're well and hope you're in the best of health. By the grace of God, I'm good. Thank you very much. Alhamdulillah. Well, George, here we are again. Um, it's incredible. Can't believe what's happening here. I've um, been watching the news absolutely shell-shocked. All this violence, this cycle of violence doesn't seem to be stopping. More, more violence making more orphans. These orphans are being recruited again to create more orphans. When is this going to stop? No, you're right. It's, I mean, this could be Gaza, about which Saudi Arabia couldn't lift a finger, couldn't say a word, couldn't even give a dollar even when they promised it. And not, it's not Gaza, it's not Israel, it's Arabs bombing and killing other Arabs. It is beyond belief, this corrupt tyranny of Saudi Arabia destroying the beautiful Yemen. And to what end? For what purpose? And what will be the outcome? I'll tell you the outcome, as I told you last week, and I believe the week before. The Saudi dictatorship's days are numbered. This war has hastened the demise of the Saudi dictatorship. Many, many, maybe even most of the soldiers in the Saudi Arabian army are Yemenis. The Yemenis are powerful fighters and heavily, highly motivated. And an attack on Yemen will unite the vast majority of Yemenis, not just in Yemen, but in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere. So if the war does spill over, the first place it's going to spill over is in Saudi Arabia itself. That's my view. Faz, you run a charity here. You must be concerned about the humanitarian situation that's fast developing there. I'm very concerned, George. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm running a charity called Mercy Worldwide, um, and we've got our cyclist, Mr. Ahmed Nazir, who's cycling around the world to, to raise funds, to build orphanages because of this sectarian divide. The Israeli, the American, and the British intelligence services are creating throughout the world. What they're doing is they've created the sectarian division in Pakistan, causing suicide bombings, causing more orphans. These orphans are being recruited again by the likes of these terrorist, terrorist organizations to create more orphans. We thought we'd put a stop to it by building orphanages and giving orphans the right chance in life and to stop them from getting brainwashed. But we're trying to do that in Pakistan. They've started in Yemen. These guys, I don't know, it's unbelievable. How, 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 can people, how can people get involved in helping you, Faz? Well, look, if, if they go on to our website, www.mwtrust.com, sponsor Ahmad Nazir per mile. He's a courageous man. He is indeed, I know him well. World. He's broken the siege on Gaza with me many times. A, a, an amazing guy, a, a warrior, a true warrior, George. A, a warrior, warrior for peace and justice yep. and hat. Absolutely. Thank you, Faz, and uh, God bless you. That's www.mw.what? Dot com. Dot com. That's www.mw.com. Go there now. Mw Mercy Trump Worldwide. Dot com. Thank you very much, George. Thank, Thank you. you, Faz. Let's go to Nigeria. Ogatha, I think the name is. Let's go with that call. Ogatha in Nigeria. Welcome. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, John Galloway. Thank you. I uh, hope I got your I, name I, right, sir. Thank you very much. May God bless you. Thank you. Because you are the mirror of the world. Telling us what happened in the world. We are very, very grateful of that. 
Thank you, sir. It is unfortunately, it is unfortunately to Saudi Arabia. The Saudi Arabia is supposed to serve as a mother to unite the Muslim Puma and Muslim community. But unfortunately, if Saudi Arabia has a plane to, for, uh, to go and carry out the bombardment wherever he wants, he would have taken it straight to Israel. But unfortunately enough, it is Muslim killing Muslims. Why is it all in the Muslim country that they are picking arms against each one another? Because of maladministration. This unfortunately, it is unacceptable in the whole world. We, the Saudi, it is this war, if he has not taken it, will be a spillover. It will be a spillover uh, in the sense that the Shia will face, uh, the, 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 the Sunni face Shia, Shia face Sunni. And before you understand one word, that means the Saudi Arabia and his island, they are, uh, 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 they are looking for the third world war. All of well, uh, of course, I, I was trying to make the I, I was I was trying to make the point earlier that Ali Abdullah Saleh was the president of Yemen for 33 years. He had the closest relationship to Saudi Arabia. They saved his life, and now they want to paint a war in which forces loyal to him are the major fighting force as some kind of Sunni Shia battle. It's completely absurd. Let's go to another Faz in Canada. Go ahead, Faz. Welcome to the show. Hello again, George. Very well, thanks. Go on. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to share some thoughts. Uh, I'm far from an expert on the subject, but uh, I was going nostalgic a few days ago, and I was listening to the mother of all talk shows on Talk Sport. Ah, uh, uh, yes, I frequently shows. do myself. Yep, and I listened to a Libyan guy who offered to share the oil of Libya with Berlusconi and uh, Cameron. I remember and I him well, yes. Yep, and I think that's the problem with the Arab world, coming to the first question. Um, it actually presents an interesting case study versus Iran, now that we have the nuclear agreement. I think in the case of Iran, you have a population that by and large defended the country's right to nuclear technology. And so there was never any kind of disagreement between the regime and the people on the issue of the nuclear program. And that is why the Iranian nation managed to um, secure such a good right. agreement. And it's been very, very difficult for the P5 plus 1 to coerce to break them, Iran yeah. into, into giving up its program and its rights to nuclear technology. Whereas in the Arab world that's riveted by sectarianism, you have people who are willing to share pretty much not just the oil, but perhaps everything else, even sovereignty, with the Western world. And I think that's really the problem. That's the difference between what's happening now, for example, in Yemen, where you have um, the Arabs being more concerned with, um, you know, trivial sectarian issues, rather than defending their rights to having, you know, the true sovereignty, the true dignity that uh, they deserve, and that they rightly should have like any other proud people on the face of the earth. Well, look, Faz, uh, I don't remember the last time I clapped uh, a call, but I just clapped yours. Uh, it was a magnificent one. Uh, I largely agreed with it. Uh, I'm with the Arabs, Faz, and all my life I've been with the Arabs, and I expect to end my life with the Arabs. My relationship with Iran is very, very slight. I've only been there, I think, twice and very briefly, and I don't know many Iranians. But what you said there is absolutely correct. The reason that Iran is still standing strong and tall and dignified in the face of its enemies and all their schemes, assassination of nuclear scientists, subversion, bombing, spying, terrorism, economic sanctions, quarantine, ostracism. The reason why Iran has survived all of that is because the Iranian people have stood united and dignified behind their rights. While so many, even so-called revolutionary Arabs, have been ready to sell even their sovereignty Never mind their resources, and God knows what else they would sell. I don't want to go down that road too far. God knows what else they would sell for a bit of patronage, a bit of money, a bit of favor from this or that 
Western capital. That's the difference. The Iranian revolution, with all its faults and all its mistakes, has been a genuinely anti-imperialist revolution. Apart from its religious dimension, which is obviously important and precious to them, it is, from my point of view, even more impressively, a revolution which says no one will tell us what to do. No one will steal that which is ours. No one will encroach upon our rights. Even if we have to eat grass, we will never allow foreigners to rule us again as they did in the past, directly or through the tyrants indirectly. That's the difference between the Iranian revolution and say, as you've brought it up, the Libyan revolutionary, in quotes, that was on my radio show uh, of great uh, beloved memory uh, some years ago. When I asked him, do you think Berlusconi and, and Haig and all these other people are going to bomb your country for free? Do you think they have no designs? upon that which is yours. He said, they can have it. We'll give it to them. Of course, it hasn't worked out that way because actually what happened in Libya was that the country is so decimated and destroyed, nobody's making any money at all. No, is in Algeria, a real revolutionary country. No, welcome. Welcome, George. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. You want to know why Israel is upset about the Iranian uh, deal? I do. Yes. Yes, it is very clear. Because when the negotiation was end, John Kerry has cr had cried. Why did he do that? Because it is an end of an empire. Now he accepts to partage, to share. He shared in Ukraine, he shared in ASEAN Bank, he shared in the, the, the dollarization campaign from Russia, and now he shared with, with Iran. And he shared in a situation where he was the most powerful in the Middle East, with his base, with his navy, with his uh, ship, with everything. Now they can forget the Nile, the Euphrat, and the great Israel. They lost Lebanon, they lost Syria, and probably Bahrain. Yemen is not lost again, but they will pay it, and they will pay it. Voila. What a great level of calls we're getting tonight. Thanks for that one. I'm only pressing on because the next caller is in Yemen. Syed, will Saudi Arabia's war against your country spill over? Hello. Hello, George. How are you? By the grace of God, I'm good. Nice I to am, hear. Uh, yes, uh, I would like to answer your second question, that this is a purely an illegal strike from the Saudi Arabia. And number two, they are called themselves the Hadman Harman Sharifain. They are the main server of these two holy mosques. And this is the, their attitude to, to make an illegal strike on the Yemen, killing innocent Yemenis. What type of these people? What they want? Like, see, they have a, they have a fear that maybe these uh, Houthis will attack on the Saudi Arabia. This is their internal part of the Yemen. This is internal internal issue of the Yemen. Just like in 1999, Musharraf took over the uh, government of the Nawaz Sharif. And if the India start attacks on Pakistan, said, no, I, we have a fear that maybe this is a military government will attack on us. Do you think this is a logic? This is not a logic. This is uh, just a fear. And they started an illegal, uh, illegal uh, war in, inside the Yemen. It's a baseless war. Are you safe? You are, are you safe, Syed? Where, where in Yemen are you? I am in Sana. And how is the situation? They just bombed the defense ministry. I don't know how yeah, they imagine they just, that would help just, them in any yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, you are correct. You are correct. They are just bombed the, uh, bombing the, the, the ministry of uh, uh, defense here. And, and my question is, on what basis they are doing? They are, this is internal issue of the Yemen. Yes, right? indeed. Uh, that's, 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 the point, that's the point. That's the point I've been making come. for the last three weeks that interfering in other people's civil conflicts is very rarely a good idea. Syed, what's the attitude of the people in the street in Sana when they see their 
city being destroyed from the air by their neighbor, a fellow Arab, fellow Muslim country. They, 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 are, they are hitting Saudis too much because they, everybody is saying this is our internal issue. Still, you can see the Houthis didn't attack the borders of the Saudi Arabia. They and did not. And where is Saudi Arabia when there is an attack on the, on the Palestine? Why they are not using their power? We both know the answer to that, Why Syed. they are not using their forces? They are only using on Yemen. For what? We both know the answer to that one. Thanks for that call. Stay safe. Nasir is in Pakistan on the same subject. Nasir, welcome. Thank you very much, George, for having me on the, on the show. Thank you. And You're most welcome. I just welcome. want to quickly come back to the point because I think it is... Thank you very much. It's critical for the world to understand that it is time to bring some peace and harmony and some decency in the world today. And what's happening in Yemen, I think it's a, it's a flagrant violation of the rights of the Yemeni people and basically of human beings, of women and children and babies and, and our sisters. And I think, like you said, I, I've been in Yemen for 12 years. I was in Sana'a, I was in Taiz, I was working there. And this is an eternal part. And Saleh Abdullah Saleh, as you know, was the president, and he was the best ally of the Saudi Arabian monarchy. For 33 now, years. Basically, what's happened is this is just an internal. This is just an internal contradiction between the two, between the tribes. It is not a Sunni or a or a Shia war. It's it not Sunni. It's not Shia. It's Yemen not existential uh, as a threat to Saudi Arabia, far less America or far less Britain. It's absurd for these foreign powers to think they can solve a problem like this by bombing Yemen, one of the world's poorest countries, Nasir. Absolutely. And what I'm saying is that, you know, the Saudi monarchy now, unfortunately, with a very heavy heart, I said since the arrival of Saad, they have not been making the right decisions. I even urge today that the younger brothers of King Faisal should follow the principles and the guidelines of the elder brother, King Faisal, who had kept all these countries as friends. Nigeria, Somalia, Ethiopia, Iraq, Iran, all the countries, Yemen, Oman, all the countries were friends. Please follow your elder brother's sensible wisdom, uh, wisdom that he had given to you. Since his departure, you have destroyed the, all the bodyguards of Saudi Arabia. All these countries were having good work with Saudi Arabia. And whenever they used to have a problem, the king used to call them over in Mecca and resolve the problem. For God's sake, in this Yemen, find a diplomatic and a political solution. Use your goodwill, use power, but don't use the power like the Americans have done all over, from Indochina, from Cambodia, to all the countries, Iran, they've destroyed all the countries of the world. Now, here I want to say just one thing, George, that you know, any colonialism, colonialism is bad. But wherever the British went in East Africa and Uganda, Kenya, Pakistan, said, when they left, they left systems behind. The railway system, the taxation, the judiciary. The Americans, wherever they go, they destroy the country, destroy the infrastructure, destroy the, the culture, the, the health, the education, everything. And then in the end, they're running with their helicopters. Now, we have seen in the last 10 years, 12 years, all over the Middle East. Why don't these rulers understand? I think the Muslim leadership right now is totally bankrupt. They well, uh, it's like they uh, it's, it's like There's a no university. You need a brilliant mind to brilliant mind to see the obvious. Well, uh, it's like a university here this evening. The quality of calls has been outstanding. I'd only demur at the uh, relative, uh, relatively benign picture you painted of the British occupation uh, of its empire. But thanks for that great call from Pakistan. Mohammed is on the line in South Wales. Always worth listening to on the uh, nuclear agreement. Mohammed, go ahead, sir. Uh, Assalamu alaikum to you, George. How are you? Salam. Good, good. Well, uh, Israel is always, uh, uh, well, Israel wants to be the dominating power in the M Middle East. So therefore, they have to have propaganda against the uh, Iranian government, right? They got their own atomic bomber, about 200 or more, and nobody is saying anything about them. They're not no. talking about that. But Iran and the Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, 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 bless him, 
said in his speech, right, that we will never ever have atomic bomb because it's against Islamic uh, law. And so therefore, I don't know why, right, uh, Israel uh, need to make propaganda and, um, and the European country and America, they know truly, right, what is the uh, ground behind it. All it is because Iran is, inshallah, standing against this bully and this terrorist country, European and NATO and America, and that's what they don't like. That's the bottom line behind it. They are making all these excuses uh, and their senators and their Congress people because they are puppets of the Zionist lobby in America. They have to bow to them and, and uh, speak on behalf of their dirty work which they are doing it very nicely against the rest of the world. Basically what it is, Saudi Arabia is another country where they are doing the dirty work for America, right, and NATO. Because well, that's what right. It is, Mohammed, going Mohammed, I'm going to cut you off uh, uh, for no other reason than that we've got so many people on the line and only moments left. I want to get one more call in. Thanks for that, Mohammed. Nayala is in Malawi. Let's hear from Nayala. Go ahead, please. Good evening, George. Good evening to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this chance. Um, I'm commenting on why Israel is never on the Iran P5 plus one nuclear deal. I have uh, several reasons, but maybe the main ones being that Israel has not solved it. Foundation. That's the basic one. The Can you speak speak Asia directly Asia into the Asia mouthpiece, Nayala? Nayala, it's not a great line. Oh, yeah. Speak directly into the mouthpiece, if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it. I'm saying Israel has no such foundation. Ah, what a pity! Look, Hello. Nayala, Nayala, it's not going to work. Uh, the line is just not uh, good enough. But thanks for trying. And do come back to comment in the future. I did ask the questions, why is Israel nervous about the agreement? The principal reason is that they want to be the absolutely hegemonic, dominant power in the region, which is why they were set up in the first place. They were set up by the British Empire in order to be a fortress, a vanguard, a citadel for imperial interests and never to brook any threat from any Arab or Muslim country in their region. The Islamic Republic of Iran with all its strength and dignity is regarded by them as an affront to that project. But the Iranians are standing tall. You can continue the discussion on Twitter at comment underscore press TV. I hope you enjoyed the show, and if you did, come back next week, God willing. Hello, if you comment, name and a number, and just make sure that you're telling me volume center zero. Zero, zero. Can you spell your name for me? Yeah, I know, I know. You need to put through this. You need to put number, and then we'll be